Hola, ¿cómo estás? Espero que estés súper bien. This is Tamara Marie, host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Now, before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity that you're definitely going to want to take advantage of, especially if your goal is to become fluent in Spanish. For a limited time only, my team is opening the doors to listeners of the podcast to take advantage of a free language coaching session. Now, in this session, it's not just we're teaching you about verbs or grammar, but we're really going to do a deep dive into what are your goals for learning Spanish, assess where you are on your journey to fluency at the moment, and help you map out a 90-day plan for how you can get to fluency. So we are going to help you take your Spanish to the next level, whether you're afraid of speaking Spanish or you just get a little bit nervous when you're talking to native speakers, or maybe you've got some of the basics down, but you really know that you struggle with getting your Spanish to flow and your listening skills aren't up to par. Whatever it is, even if it is a specific grammar issue, we will help you map out how to tackle that. And normally these sessions do cost, so we are offering a few slots for free. There are limited spaces available and they'll only be open up through the end of the month. So make sure you sign up. Go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach to book your free language coaching session where we will help you map out a 90-day plan to get to Spanish fluency. Okay, let's get started with the episode. Bienvenidos! Welcome to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast, the show for Spanish learners that love music, travel, and culture. Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Mari. Hola y bienvenidos al episodio 120. Welcome to episode 120 of the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast. In this episode, I have two very special guests from the Spanish Con Salsa team, Jael y Maribel. Jael is from Nicaragua and Maribel is from Colombia and she lives in Medellin. They have been working with us at Spanish Con Salsa, doing group classes and individual lessons. And I really wanted them to come on so that you can get to meet them before maybe you book a lesson or if you're thinking about joining the Spanish Con Salsa Fluency Club, our monthly membership program. I wanted you to hear from Jael and Maribel because they are available for lessons on our website at SpanishConSalsa.com if you look for one-on-one lessons and you're looking for a tutor, you're looking for a coach, someone that can help you not only learn Spanish, learn about the mechanics of the language, but help you get motivated to reach your goals. They are really, really great. And I wanted you to be able to meet them. And so I invited them on the podcast today to introduce them to you all. So I hope you enjoy our conversation. We talk about the seven habits of highly effective language learners. And those of you who are familiar with Stephen Covey, um, if you went to business school, you definitely probably had this in your curriculum (laughs) where you had to read this book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. But we're going to talk about that from a language learning perspective. And with their experience combined um, between Maribel and Jael, they talk a lot about what they've seen, not only in their own experience as language learners, but also with the many students that they've worked with over the years. So there's so much value packed into this conversation. I know that you will enjoy it. It is in English and Spanish because if you guys remember, if you're in our Facebook group, I did ask a question about our interviews and asked, you know, what is your preference in terms of language? And a lot of you said you like having a mix of Spanish and English. So I try to do that whenever possible. So this episode will be in both languages. And as always, you can check out the show notes page, learn Spanish con salsa dot com slash 120 to be able to access the transcript and the show notes for this episode. Before we get started, I'm excited to let you know that this week is going to be a little bit different on the podcast. This week is a week where I'm going to be featuring our Spanish Con Salsa members. So every day this week, I will be uh, replaying an episode of the podcast 
where I interviewed one of our members and give you a little bit of an update on how they're doing with their Spanish in their journeys. So during this whole week, I'll be spotlighting different members so that you can see really what you can expect to get out of membership in the Spanish Con Salsa Fluency Club. And of course, that's because if you aren't on our email list, you probably don't know this yet, but if you are, you probably have already been getting our messages. But this week is the week to join Spanish Con Salsa. So if you want to be a part of our group coaching program, that is our membership that we offer where I'm working with you one-on-one, you're working with our team to really help you get to conversational fluency. And this is for people who are really committed and really ready to make some real progress with Spanish and may be frustrated because, you know, you may have tried to learn before, you may have had some intentions, you set goals at the beginning of the year or at any time in the past, and you're not where you want to be. Joining our community and finding your language learning tribe is the best way to help you stay motivated to reach those goals. We provide access to all of our courses so that you can learn any aspect of the language that you're having trouble with. We also provide weekly group conversation practice and you also get coaching directly from me. So anytime you get stuck, you just reach out and I make sure that I get an answer to you to help you get unstuck. Our members are the most welcoming and fun group. Everyone is learning through music, through conversation. We talk a lot about culture. We have live events each and every month and you're able to ask questions. And we also bring in guest speakers. Uh, So there's a lot going on with the membership, but it's everything that you need to reach Spanish fluency. So if you want to check it out this week only, again, we're closing the doors on Sunday. So you don't have a lot of time to be on the fence about this. And once we close doors on Sunday, we won't be opening back up again until the fall. So this is really your last chance. If you want to make some real progress before September, now is the time to sign up. SpanishConSalsa.com slash join. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash join. Okay, so now let's get to our conversation with Hael and Maribel. Hola, Hael y Maribel. Bienvenidas al podcast Learn Spanish con Salsa. Hola, Tamara. Gracias, gracias por la invitación. Gracias, muchas muchas gracias por la invitación. Y chicas, ¿puedes presentarles a la audiencia? Porque... Ustedes son parte de la familia de Spanish con Salsa, de las profesoras que tenemos. Entonces, empezamos con Jael. ¿Puedes presentarte a la audiencia? Sí, cómo no. Pues soy Jael Torres, soy de Nicaragua y soy maestra aquí en Spanish con Salsa ya hace casi un año, creo, un poquito más de un año. Ha sido interesante todo este tiempo. He podido conocer a los alumnos y... Aprender español también con música, muchas frases, muchas cosas de las islas, por ejemplo, caribeñas. Y realmente me gusta enseñar idiomas. Tengo la mitad de mi vida prácticamente enseñando idiomas porque hago trabajo voluntario con lenguaje de señas, con los sordos. Entonces ya 14 años enseñando lenguaje de señas, español por casi todo ese tiempo también. Enseño inglés también a niños, entonces eso es lo que hago. <laughs> so my name is Jai Torres, I'm from Nicaragua, it's a little country in Central America, but beautiful by the way. And I teach languages, I've been teaching here in Spanish with Salsa since like one year ago, enjoying all of this time, this process, learning also and teaching with music. I teach languages since I was 14 years old so the half of my life I've been teaching languages and I teach sign language to deaf people I also teach Spanish and English to kids Gracias, bienvenida y Maribel Sí, uh, yo soy Maribel soy colombiana me encanta el concepto de Spanish con salsa entonces disfruto mucho eh, ayudando ayudándolos a ustedes a todos los estudiantes a mejorar su español Los idiomas también son mi pasión, eh, me gusta mucho aprenderlos y desde hace aproximadamente dos años eh, los estoy enseñando, eh, bueno, enseño español, eh, aunque en algún momento también enseñé inglés para principiantes y me encanta eh, usar los idiomas como una herramienta de comunicación y de, 
aprendizaje no solamente del idioma como tal, sino de diferentes culturas y de diferentes puntos de vista alrededor del mundo. Well, my name is Maribel. I am Colombian. I enjoy a lot teaching in Spanish con salsa because I love the concept of using the music as a tool for learning a new language. I love languages. I have been teaching Spanish for almost two years, but I have been a constant student of languages since all my life. So I really enjoy languages and I am so happy to be here with you and help you to improve your Spanish. Gracias y bienvenida. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to join me on the podcast because I know that you guys are very good at teaching um, and working with the students and we always get great reviews. So anyone that's listening who's had a class with Hayel or Maribel, then you already know. But if you haven't already, um, hopefully you get that opportunity uh, when you sign up for Spanish con Salsa because everything's just more fun, uh, especially when you're learning with music, right? <laughs> To start out, I want to ask you both, because you have experience not just as language teachers, but also as language learners. And I think that to be an effective language teacher, having the experience of learning the language is so important because you know what the students are going through. You understand the struggle, right? So I'll start with you, Hyle. Can you tell me what do you think is the hardest part about learning languages? For me, for being honest, in English, I am always struggling with the grammar. So, because Spanish and English is very different, the grammar and the way of thinking, learning a new way of thinking, trying to figure it out what is this person trying to say, because it's not the way that I think, it's a different way. So, for me, that part, the grammar, I struggle a lot with the grammar in English. I still learning English and trying to improve it. So yeah, that's for me. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think grammar, there's so much to it and you really do have to think in that same pattern, right? So if, if you're if you're speaking in a language where the words are in a different order, you almost have to think backwards in what you're used to, right? Because you're like, oh, that word usually comes first. And when you're thinking of you've got to switch all that around. So yeah, that definitely, I think that's why a lot of people, when it comes to learning Spanish with the grammar, They start to slow down a lot when they're talking because they're thinking in their head. You see them calculating, okay, which verb do I need to conjugate, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they're they're really struggling with um, with that because you do have to change the way you think. So I think that's um that's a great point. And what about you, Maribel? What do you think for you and what you've seen with some of your students as well is one of the hardest parts of, of language learning? For me, the hardest part, even in English, and I also learn in French, is to be constant because I start like so happy and with big enthusiasm and I go and after one week and it's like, eh, <laughs> I don't want to keep studying or I feel lazy. So being constant and especially with French, find people to practice with because I am in Colombia. So it's a little easier to find English speakers But French speakers, not that easy. So um, sometimes the practice, it's a little harder to get, especially conversation. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that might be the hardest part for me, like being constant and finding conversation practice. It's interesting you mentioned conversation practice because for me, it's one of the, the um, things that people say about Spanish as well. They say, oh, you know, I, I really want to speak Spanish, and but I just don't have anyone to talk to. And you talked about being in, in Medellin and not having a lot of people that speak French. But I wonder, uh, with technology, you know, we've all been living on, on Zoom, uh, not by choice, right, for <laughs> uh, the past year or so. And so we've been in this world where we can connect with people virtually. We can connect through the Internet. So do you think it's, um, it makes it easier to find people to talk to, even in French that you're learning or in Spanish or any other language? Do you think that technology makes it easier to find those people to talk to, even if they're not in your city where you live? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think thanks to Internet and the new reality that we are having through this pandemic, we, can, we realize we can do everything online, anything. So having language exchange, 
is also a possibility. It was before, but now it's more common. And then that's where I go back to being constant. <laughs> For me, that's like the, the difficult part, uh, like make a routine, for example. Okay, I'm going to set one hour every week for having a conversation exchange. So that's the tricky part. But I agree. And actually, I have seen some language exchange uh, in some platforms. So it is possible. <laughs> and it's easier, definitely, than before. So, Hayel, I want you to chime in. Do you think that consistency, like Maribel mentioned, is one of the important things uh, to do when you're trying to learn a new language? Do you think that that's helped you become successful with, with learning English? And also, I know you teach sign language. So do you think consistency is also um, a habit that uh, leads to success when you're learning the language? Yeah, consistency. Because I have been learning English since 10 years maybe or 12 years all in Latin America we all take English classes when we are in the high school at least or sometimes in the elementary school so I can say that I've been learning English my whole life but there was there was a point that I didn't practice any English and when I had again to speak with an English native speaker I couldn't say any words like where is the English that I've been learning the last five years it, was there somewhere in my brain I know but it needed to come back right so consistency since I started speaking English every day like 10 years ago my English went better and better and better and better so for me that's the main point of learning a language the consistency trying to do it at least every day a little bit it doesn't need to be like one hour it doesn't be and doesn't need to be like as something that you have very schedule or I'm going to do this grammar today and tomorrow this vocabulary. No, but at least if you have like 15 minutes every day or 10 minutes every day that you push yourself to speak that language that you are learning. I think for me, in my own experience, that's been like the key point for improving the English. That's my experience as a language learner. So I think it will be the same with the Spanish. I like that you mentioned that it doesn't have to be, you know, so big, right? We, when we think of learning a language, we treat it like a job, the serious matter. Okay, I have to find the perfect grammar textbook and I have to follow it to the letter and I have to do all the exercises. And instead of just saying, if I can just find 10 or 15 minutes today to interact with this language, then I'll be making progress. So I think, you know, Doing things in small in small bites, small pieces, really does make it easier for you to um, stay motivated and stay consistent. Because if you go three months without any, you know, language uh, that you're learning, then it's very hard to pick back up again. Versus if you just say, "Okay, I'll take 15 minutes," and then you're making small progress, but at the end of three months, you've made so much progress, right? Because what 15 minutes times you know seven days a week times three months, you know, do the math. It's so much better. Than waiting until you have four hours <laughs> in a day to study. So I, I like that you said that this taking a small step and not making it too big and overwhelming. What do you think about what Maribel said about language exchanges? So you mentioned speaking English a lot really helped you. So do you think it helps talking to native English speakers or is it just you speaking to anyone you could in English every day? Yeah, well, at least for me, with the sign language volunteer program, I have a lot of and, uh, other people, sorry, that, that they don't speak Spanish. So I was pushed to speak the language. So we had a big exchange of languages. Right now, in the point that we are, I still doing that, but online, on Zoom too, because <laughs> there the pandemic, you know, Corona, all of us know about. So I really believe that exchange languages program It's a very good tool because you are exposed to native people and that's the way that you learn like from them. You need to, of course, you can go on the books and study the grammar, but that's just um, information. You need now to put that information in practice. So, yeah, of course, the most that you can speak with a native people it will be the best. 
Maribel, what else would you say besides, you know, we've talked about being consistent, right? Being constant with, with your study. We've talked about having that speaking practice with other people. You talked about taking small, a small amount of time to, to learn every day and being consistent. What else have you noticed your most successful students have done? Like the students were, when you started, they really were beginners and then you worked with them and now you talk to them and you, you see the progress they've made. What are some of the things that they've done that you've noticed that really made them successful? And, or you can also speak to your own experience with French and English. So what I um, encourage a lot is to be brave, to make mistakes. Because as language students, we want to do everything perfect. We want to have perfect grammar. We have to do everything as it says in the book. But mistakes are a fundamental part of learning. If you don't do, if you don't make mistakes, you won't advance because we are not computers. We don't record everything as it comes. So we need to explore, we need to try. And true mistakes is when we start um, growing in our, in our learning process. So I always encourage my students to speak. Usually what I do, because we don't like when someone corrects us. So I just like take notes because I just want to let them speak. It's, 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 I mean, you feel ashamed <laughs> when you start to, to talk because you know you're going to make mistakes and you feel like, oh my God, what I'm saying. <laughs> so I, I try to make a very comfortable environment, like free of judgment zone, and just speak. And after that, we go with some feedback and correct some common mistakes. So I think as a teacher or as a student, the important thing is see the value of mistakes and from them, like start building the, the correct structure, the correct way to say things. No, you're right. I think no one wants to be corrected, especially when you're an adult. You know, I think that's the, the thing about learning a language when you're, um, you know, not in, in school anymore and you you learning on your own. I think we're so used to just being right and being competent and knowing what we're saying and feeling smart, right? We don't want to feel stupid. No one wants to, <laughs> no one wants to feel silly. So I think that's part of what happens when people are learning um, a language. And I, and I like that you mentioned being brave. I love that because it does take courage to speak another language because you, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position because you know you're going to make mistakes and you're going to say things wrong. Um, so, Hayal, what about you? What did, what's your perspective on that? What, do you, what have you noticed um, in your own study and then from your students you've worked with that has really made them really take it to the next level and, and, and speak better? If you make a mistake, we all have bad days. Like, you have a day that you cannot say any work in the language that you are learning. I know. I know I have this. I have those days. We are tired. We've been working. We have an emotional problem or whatever problem in, in job or sick or whatever, right? So there are some days that you cannot say any word in that language. So I always like to tell my students that it's okay. If the Spanish is not coming out, it's okay. Don't worry. Tomorrow is another day. And if today's Spanish is so bad, tomorrow will be better. So don't give up. If one day is bad, it's okay. Let it go. It's not the day for the Spanish. If you've been trying 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it's not coming out. It's okay. Tomorrow, it will be better. So I think that part is important. And also the sense of humor. For example, with me, I remember with my friend, I was like, how can you say that you look good? And I don't know why I couldn't say that. And I told my friend, yeah, you are looking good looking. And he said, what? You're looking good looking. That was so funny. We laughed a lot of me saying that. What, what's that? Looking good looking. Because in Spanish, it's like, te ves bien. Looking good looking. And that doesn't exist in English. It was like five years ago. And we're still laughing of that mistake that I make. Because it's so funny. And now we use it in English. Yeah, you're looking good looking. It's like, yo, that's a mistake. 
yeah, we are making a joke about that, but you know that you can't say that in a proper English. So having a sense of humor, you it can also help you to learn. If you take the things like with, okay, I made this mistake. Okay, just laugh at that and keep going. Yeah, I agree with that. So we are so used to that a mistake is something bad, but it's not really bad and it could be funny. And I'm sure after that and the joke, you will never forget that that the proper way to say it. So that's really important to also twist the mistake and do something good with that, like having a joke. Exacto. Entonces, hablando de errores y humor, ¿pueden compartir alguna historia chistosa de algunas de las clases? Ok. Yo estaba pensando, cuando vi esta pregunta, dije, ¿qué voy a compartir? Han habido algunos momentos divertidos, como por ejemplo, un día terminé el material temprano y yo oh, oh, tengo 10 minutos más y tengo que extender la clase por 10 minutos. ¿Y ahora qué les digo? Ay, señor, ¿ahora qué hago? Ok, vamos a jugar. Aquí le decimos el ahorcado, hangman. No sé si se le conoce hangman de otra forma en algún otro país. Y yo, ahora lo voy a poner a jugar el ahorcado a los alumnos en aquí en Spanish con Salsa. Y dije, voy a escoger una palabra difícil. Entonces, según yo, escogí una palabra difícil. No me acuerdo, sinceramente no me acuerdo qué fue la palabra, pero era una palabra bien larga y difícil. Y dije, ahora sí, yo gano. Pero ni aún así pude... Todos, todos agarraron la palabra, todos entendieron la palabra la primera. Entonces le iba preguntando letra por letra, uno por uno, y todos entendieron la palabra la primera. Ese día nos reímos mucho porque yo pensé que por fin yo iba a ganar, pero no gané. Es que son muy inteligentes, la verdad, son muy inteligentes. Esa fue una reciente, que nos reímos mucho en el momento, todos nos reímos mucho de mi, de mi idea, que no funcionó bien. Y Maribel, eh, y también un, una historia de, de tu aprendizaje de francés o, o inglés. Aquí estaba intentando como recordar. No recuerdo una en particular, pero para mí es muy cómico cuando tengo un estudiante y por algún motivo me sale con una frase súper coloquial. Entonces cada que eso pasa, yo me sorprendo mucho, pero también... Yo me río y yo, pero ¿dónde aprendiste eso? ¿Quién te enseñó esa palabra? <risa> es, es, es muy gracioso cuando ellos vienen y te dicen algo súper coloquial. Es como, por ejemplo, un estudiante eh, en Colombia tenemos la palabra Lela, que Lelo es alguien como un poco torpe, como despistado. Entonces ella cometió un error y me dijo, ¡ay, qué Lela! Por supuesto que no es así. Y yo como que, ¿qué? ¿Qué, qué? ¿Usted dónde aprendió esa palabra? <risa> es que, ay, es que tengo un amigo colombiano que no sé qué. Y yo, ah, excelente, muy bien. Sígale pre preguntando frases coloquiales. <risa> y Jael, ¿puede compartir alguna palabra de Nicaragua? Porque yo no sé mucho de Nicaragua, yo sé de Caribe, un poquito de Colombia, pero hay palabras que se usan en Nicaragua que no, no usan en otros países. Sí, sí, mira, entonces la palabra que por excelencia que me gusta enseñarle a los alumnos es tuani, pero con ese acento, tuani, porque en Costa Rica dicen tuanis con ese, pero no, 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 no. aquí en Nicaragua es tuani sin ese porque nosotros, un buen nica cuando habla comfortable, like en confianza, no decimos las S al final, entonces es tuani, tuani es algo súper cool. Algo súper cool. Entonces, si sí, vas a decir, vámonos de viaje, que tú ni vámonos, pues. Entonces, sí, esa es la palabra por excelencia que toda gente que viene a Nicaragua tiene que saber algo tú Cuéntanos algo de Nicaragua, uh, de tu país, porque es un país pequeño, ¿no? Y yo no sé mucho de Nicaragua, he venido a Costa Rica, uh, pero cuéntanos un poquito de tu país. Sí, fíjate que es un país pequeño, es un país bonito, agradable. Creo que hay dos cosas que puedo resaltar del país. Mira, número uno, la naturaleza. Hay una naturaleza muy bonita. Hay muchos lugares turísticos donde puedes ir y son interesantes e impactantes. Por ejemplo, puedes ir a un volcán y ver el lago de lava. Estar 10 minutos cerca de la lava es súper impactante, sobre todo si vas de noche puedes ver el lago de lava rojo y cómo sube el azufre y todo en la noche es un paisaje precioso 
también las playas del Caribe, tenemos Costa Caribe, Corn Island y toda la costa atlántica es preciosa, la verdad, preciosa. Entonces puedo destacar el turismo natural, es, hay mucha naturaleza muy bonita que ver aquí. Y segundo, la hospitalidad de las personas. La, los nicaragüenses somos conocidos en, bueno, tal vez en Centroamérica, que no nos conocen mucho en otros lugares, pero la cultura nica es con los extranjeros sobre todo, se les da mucho a los extranjeros. La gente nicaragüense es muy hospitalaria con los demás, con, con gente de otros países. Es parte de la cultura, siempre nos gusta compartir lo mejor que tenemos en la casa con la gente que viene. Entonces, esas son las dos cosas que podría resaltar. La naturaleza y la hospitalidad de la gente en general. Así que vengan a Nicaragua. Después del COVID, pero vengan. Sí, sí, cuando podemos, ¿no? Y, y Maribel, cuéntanos un poquito de Medellín, porque yo sé que mucha gente piensa en Pablo Escobar cuando piensa en Colombia y Medellín. Y yo sé que eso no es la verdad, especialmente de ahora, de la ciudad y de, del país. Entonces, cuéntanos un poquito de Medellín que quieres compartir con la audiencia. Sí, de Medellín, hoy en día es un, un lugar muy popular para expat y para nómadas digitales. Y hay una infraestructura muy grande para este tipo de población extranjera porque hay muchos coworking, hay muchos cafés y lugares con muy buena velocidad de internet. Entonces la mayoría de extranjeros que vemos en Medellín son nómadas digitales o son expat y ya están viviendo de forma permanente en esta ciudad o en otras ciudades de Colombia. Parte de esa transformación es debido a que la administración de la ciudad le ha apostado a, a la innovación, en especial en el sector de la tecnología y de la información. Entonces, incluso ellos tienen la idea de convertir Medellín como el Silicon Valley de, de Antioquia y de Colombia, porque le apuestan muchísimo a, a las tecnologías. Entonces, parte de es, esa transformación ha ayudado también a incentivar el turismo y a cambiar la cara violenta y relacionada al narcotráfico de la ciudad. Y por otro lado está el clima, eh, por algo se le llama a Medellín la ciudad de la eterna primavera, porque su clima es muy estable <ríe> en cuanto a temperatura, pero un poco bipolar porque eh, por la mañana hace sol y por la tarde llueve, pero en, en la temperatura es muy estable. Estamos, Medellín es como una taza, entonces todas las casas y los edificios están en la parte de abajo y estamos rodeados de montañas. Entonces es un paisaje muy bonito y es muy verde, entonces llama mucho la atención y es barato <ríe> en comparación con otras ciudades eh, importantes en Latinoamérica y la hospitalidad de la gente, que creo que es algo que tenemos en común todo de Latinoamérica. Yo digo que lo principal es la calidez de la gente y el clima. Y ya con eso viene muchísimas más como avances en cuanto a infraestructura, tecnología y todo este tipo de cosas. Entonces, al final, para, para terminar con la conversación de hoy, Jael, ¿puedes compartir tu canción favorita de Nicaragua? Ay, 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 esa es una pregunta difícil. Pero mira, me gusta de Nicaragua, Luis Enrique, yo no sé mañana, me gusta, me encanta. Luis Enrique también tiene algunas canciones en los 80 que son bonitas, las salsas, luego él pausó su carrera y la retomó hace unos años. Entonces, de las más modernas de Luis Enrique, me encanta salsa, me encanta yo no sé mañana. Pero claro, tradicionales, ahí hay algunas otras, yo a ve de vez en cuando escucho todos los ritmos y hay un señor que, es, bueno, había se murió, Don Otto de la Rocha tiene una canción muy bonita que se llama Pelo de May, así, Pelo de May, es a una americana pero rubia, como el pelo del maíz que es amarillo, entonces la canción se la canta a su amor de los Estados Unidos, rubia. Me encanta la letra, me encanta la forma en la que la cantaba, y entonces creo que son esas dos las que me gustan de mi país. 
Y yo sé que en nuestro curso de Learn Spanish with Music tenemos la canción Yo No Sé Mañana, es alguna de mis favoritos también. Y Maribel, ¿cuál es tu canción favorita de, de Colombia? Puede ser salsa o cualquier otro género. Me encanta la música de Carlos Vives, en especial la música que es un poquito más vieja como de 1998 al principios del 2000, que es, ya son clásicos. <ríe> Pero me encanta mucho una, que es así recuerdo el nombre, que se llama La Tierra del Olvido. Y es una canción dedicada a Colombia y las cosas más bonitas y las diferentes regiones. Esa canción me gusta mucho, La Tierra del Olvido. Y lloré mucho cuando estaba fuera de Colombia escuchando esa canción. <ríe> Y de salsa me encanta el fruco y sus tesos. Es salsa, salsa brava, le decimos. Es la salsa típica de Cali y es muy movida. Y la canción de fruco y sus tesos y también el grupo Nietzsche hablan mucho sobre la historia de los negros en Colombia, de los esclavos. Entonces, es, es como... La, las letras tienen un significado, no es simplemente algo comercial, sino que nos cuenta un poquito sobre esa historia. Entonces, eh, de, ese, de ese género de salsa me encanta. Es, ellos eh, también se considera ya como clásicos de la salsa, muy buena, y eh, Carlos Vives, mis favoritos. Gracias, y es interesante porque la semana que viene voy a tener al autor de este libro que es a la fórmula despacito <ríe> y tiene historias sobre las canciones muy populares de, de uh, América Latina y esa canción de Carlos Vives está en este libro hay una historia detrás de, de esa canción muy interesante entonces uh, todos tienen que oír sí, esa, ese episodio la semana que viene entonces Muchísimas gracias, Hel y Maribel, por uh, su tiempo hoy. Y uh, al final, um, vamos a cambiar al inglés. What would you say to a student who is thinking about joining Spanish con Salsa and they're not sure if, if it's right for them? What would you say? I think that you should try it. I think that if you try, um, just see how it goes, how it goes. And I know that you're going to enjoy it. Because it's learning, but not with the pressure of learning grammar and learning a book and having exams and tests. It's not that here. We learn, but we enjoy also at the same time. And you learn about the culture of Latin America, too, because music is culture. So if you like to learn about culture, countries... It's the whole package. You know, you're learning the language, you are learning music, you are learning how to speak, you get friends in the classes, and also you are practicing your Spanish. So why not? Try. Come. We're waiting for you. <laughs> and what about you, Mariva? What would you say? Well, I think you need to think outside the box. Languages is not just uh, learning a bunch of rules. It's not just memorizing verbs. It's not just memorizing rules and structures. And in Spanish con salsa, you can learn the language and practice in a more natural way because grammar is important, but I think immersion is the key. And with the music and the methodology that Tamara designed for these courses, you're going to get it. So... Give it a try and try to think outside the box and jump uh, into the unknown and get out of your comfort zone. I love that. Think outside of the box. I, I love that. It's a perfect way to end. So thank you, Maribel and Hael, for your time today. Gracias. Gracias a ti, Tamara. Muchas gracias. I hope you enjoyed meeting Hael and Maribel, and they are both teaching classes within our Spanish Guan Salsa memberships. Make sure you apply the seven habits of highly effective language learners that Hael and Maribel shared with us in this episode. Number one, make sure you get conversation practice in as often as you can. Two, 
don't make a huge deal out of setting these big goals if you can make small progress each and every day, at least 15 minutes a day. Number three, look for language exchange opportunities for people that are native speakers of Spanish that you can talk to, like our wonderful coaches at Spanish Con Salsa. I always have to say that because they just are some of the best coaches around for language learning. Um, But in any case, if it's not uh, a teacher or it's not through our program, make sure you find native speakers that you can chat with and help um, you practice conversation on a regular basis and use the tools online as well to help you find conversation practice partners. Number four, be consistent. Make sure that whatever you do with your Spanish, that you're doing it on a consistent basis. It's much better to spend a little bit of time each day or each week versus waiting until the perfect circumstances to commit to learning. Because guess what? That perfect day is never going to arrive. So work with what you have now and be consistent. Number five, be brave. Do not be afraid to make mistakes. You're going to have to get over your fear of speaking the language, of looking silly, of sounding silly. It's part of the process. And that's why I think it's super important to find a community that you're comfortable with, like our community here at Spanish Con Salsa, because you really do get to relax. You get to open up. You get to be comfortable with speaking the language. And that is so important when it comes to proficiency down the road, when you're in conversations where you might be more uncomfortable, whether you're traveling or with strangers. It's so important to have that home base, a place where you feel safe and comfortable and supported and speaking the language that you can make those mistakes and get those corrections um, in a very kind way and begin to improve. Number six is to relax and have fun. Don't take yourself so seriously. Find things that you enjoy any way that you can find to make the language a part of your life, uh, but also make it something that's enjoyable to you is super important to stick with language learning for the long term. And number seven, inject some humor into your language learning. Have a sense of humor, be able to laugh at yourself, to laugh at those mistakes so you can learn from them uh, without feeling bad or being super self-critical. Keep it fun, keep it light. And if you follow these seven habits, you will definitely have success in getting to Spanish fluency. So don't forget, if you are interested in getting some help with your Spanish, check out SpanishConSalsa.com slash join That's SpanishQuonSalsa.com slash join for all of the information about the Spanish Quon Salsa Fluency Club. Doors close este domingo, this Sunday. You don't want to miss this opportunity. If you want to improve your Spanish this spring and summer and you really want to be ready for travel, to be able to have conversations as we're opening back up and being able to go out and talk to people, now is the time to join. So we'll be waiting for you inside the membership, Hael and Maribel. Also, you've met Kessia, who's a part of our team, who has also been on the podcast. She is also giving uh, classes each and every week, one-on-one and group classes with our members. So you really will get to develop relationships with other members, with our team um, of coaches, and I'll be there to support you one-on-one as well. So I really hope that you'll consider joining us this April because, again, you know, this is your last chance uh, until the fall. So I really want to help you this spring and summer. So SpanishConSalsa.com slash join. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. And as always, I hope something that you heard today will take you one step closer from Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. 